Well, thank you so much for that warm welcome, Alice, and, um, and good evening. It's tremendous to see so many people face-to-face uh, -face in this really um, fabulous, um, extraordinary, as we like to say. It is truly unique. Um, when I was asked by Alice to um, host this session about a year or so ago, um, I must admit, I hadn't heard um, of Chandran Nair, very naughty of me, being relatively new to, to Hong Kong. And, and I, was, I was intrigued. I was intrigued by the book. I was intrigued by um, its premise. And I was also intrigued by the notion of having um, somebody who's grown up in a world of um, white privilege um, to talk to the author of um, what I think is a really important work. And as I read it, one of the things that struck me the most was if you look at the world of literature and the world of discourse on race, um, a lot of it in terms of what those of us that work in universities would term as, in inverted commas, serious scholarship, um, is confined to the world of academics. And I think what Chandran has done is that he has not only bridged that gap, but he has actually delivered something which is original and, um, and intellectually rigorous um, in its own right. Uh, kind of uh, some of the people have asked me why did I write the book, what triggered it. And today if you go and Google uh, white privilege, uh, you'll see a lot of stuff about that toxic race relations in the United States. You get a lot of stuff about Karens and Karens and Karens yelling at black men and all of that stuff and all of that. And it's all very important, a lot of Black Lives Matter stuff. Um, but if you Google um, global white privilege, I should have done it before I wrote the book, I didn't, it's the only thing that comes up is this book. It, so no one actually looked at the idea of a global white privilege because it was so difficult to try and think about it. So I was kind of uh, fairly, fairly pleased that today if you Google global white privilege is the only thing that comes up, almost nothing else. So you all know the, the horrific events uh, around the murder of George Floyd in 2019. And during that time, after a few months, as you know, the, the Black Lives Matter movement's uh, uh, call for justice and uh, about uh, equality, etc., took on a kind of global twist uh, on the streets of London, Cambridge, universities all over the world. Uh, people said, you know, let's, down, let's take on the statues of Cecil Rhodes and all of those people. And it was seen as, yes, we recognize that there's a need to change. And if you turn down the TV stations and all the liberal media, there was things like, let's all take a knee. And my God, let's call, let's call for more diversity and inclusion in multinational companies. And, um, oh yeah, let's make sure that black actors and actresses get awards, the Oscars and things like that. And let's make a huge fuss every time there's a banana peel thrown at a black player at a football game. And my view was, who cares? Who cares about that petty stuff? Because it's a very interesting way of saying, that just happens in a few areas. There are a few bad policemen. And if you just all did all of this, it will all go away soon. And if you take down the statues, we're basically saying it's all in the past. Let's not have remnants of the past, because we're all progressive now. And the stuff about white privilege is something that um, lurks in a few nasty places, police departments, you know, a few multinational companies. But it's the world has progressed. And we, the Western world, are championing equality and all of those things. And coming from where I come from, the life uh, that I've led, you know, very uh, attuned to Western education, brought up reading Shakespeare. I had a clue what the guy was talking about, uh, but I had to pass an exam. Uh, you know, it's very difficult for me to, to, to go through all of that and think, there's something wrong here. There's something wrong about someone like me having to essentially see constantly to appeal to Western sensibilities all the time. And so given the privilege of I have had, or working in many parts of the world, and including uh, five years in Southern Africa during the liberation wars, and having met and had the privilege of meeting people like 
um, uh, Bishop Tutu, uh, Oliver Tambu, who was the, the, the uh, uh, president of the ANC during the exile period, getting involved in the liberation struggle. Today, I would be considered a terrorist and all that. And then living in the UK and other parts of the world, I recognized that something was terribly wrong. So I was talking to friends of mine, and they said, you need to write about this. Because what you're saying is all of those things are superficial, the taking the knee, the way the media covers it. But what the liberals don't want to hear is that actually you're part of the problem. Uh, your positions of power, et cetera, are entrenched in the more insidious nature of how what I call white privilege actually is woven into the very fabric of everything we know as globalization. So then I thought, OK, uh, I should write something about it. Because I didn't want to write something uh, so pertaining to what was happening in the United States, because I didn't feel qualified to do that. Although I could say I understood what racism and class war looks like, and where economic power comes from, <clears throat> based on my time in Southern Africa. But I was involved in that bit of my life. I learned from many people in the liberation struggle that this was not a black against white war. It was essentially a class war, an economic war. And the, the reluctance of whether it was Ian Smith in Rhodesia or the, well, these Afrikaners in South Africa, it was about retaining economic power control. And that's no different anywhere else. So I wrote a piece uh, about, the, 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 about how a white privilege is essentially a global phenomenon. It's well concealed, but it's constantly a need to retain economic might and supremacy through uh, reinforcing uh, white, uh, uh, or white supremacy and white uh, superiority. And uh, I couldn't get it published anywhere, so I took it to the South Time Morning Post. And the South Time Morning Post print published it and called it Fifty Shades of White, uh, because I had 50 shades <laughs> I didn't come up with that. Was, I called it Fifty Shades of White. And um, I haven't read the book, by the way. Um, and it kind of went a bit viral. And my publisher of my second book, called me up from San Francisco um, and said, do you want to turn this into a book? And I said, really? So he gave me like 48 hours and said, and Eric and my colleagues in the office were, no. Um, uh, I said, OK, I'll, I'll give you 48 hours. And I thought, OK, all right, I'll write this book. And all I wanted to do was take that article where I outlined nine spheres of globalization that all we all of us think as the norm and dissecting it into where embedded in it is white privilege and so i covered nine spheres of globalization starting with geopolitics of course from the five eyes to what's going on today to explain why the western world is today petrified by the rise of another civilization and today they're petrified because for the first time in 500 years, the West is confronted with the rise of a non-Caucasian civilization. It's the first time. So I tell my American friends, I, I understand your fear, but suck it up. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, that's how it is. You don't know how the rest of us felt for a long time. So I, I wrote about that, and that's a chapter on that. And then the other area I wrote about coming from a business background, having been in Hong Kong a long time as well, was in the business area, and I called it a non-level playing field. So if you read that chapter, you'll see I talk about the entire global architecture of international business and finance is essentially run by white people. Uh, the big four, white guys. Rating agencies, white guys. You want to do an IPO, you have to go to one of the big four. You can go to Ali, Wong, and Krishna. You have to go to Ernst and Young, right? I lost I knew Singaporeans could do maths. I mean, you could trust them to do proper audits, but that's not good enough. If you want to do an IPO, your legal, your law firm cannot be Krishna, Ali, and Wong either. It's got to be Clifford Chance or one of those. Look through all of that, and I sort of dissected that whole thing. And so the whole level playing field, there's no level playing field, and it's all contained. The big four, the big four, or big five, I forget what the name is, for the consulting firms, they're all Western consulting firms. It's tightly knit, 
they keep it. So when Uncle Sam says we're going to sanction these guys, everyone, uh, you know, follows the line. And similarly, when you look to the multilateral institutions, they're all very much the same for the IMF to the uh, to the World Bank, etc. The IMF uh, uh, chief has always got to be a, a European. They kind of made it nice. They got women too, you know, third pieces. But like I'm saying, okay, where the where the Chinese, where the black people, etc. No. And of course, the World Bank uh, had to be American too. It wasn't really put it kind of Korean American, but you know, they Americans. Uh, uh, just like the people confuse race with essentially the way you think. So then I dissected other areas about the telling of history, things we learn about, uh, we, we, we teach. I looked at culture. I wrote a piece that I've been thinking about for many years about pop music, Western pop music, as, as an instrument of mind capture. You know, I, could, I could say nothing great about Bob Dylan, sorry. The same, right? Uh, I could see nothing great about the Beatles. But my God, I was in my little country in Malaysia, in my small town. I was listening to Elvis Presley, Cliff Richard. But the music of my parents, the Bharatanatyam, all those beautiful music, the Kathakali, and all of that from India, China. No. In fact, I was actively suppressing that as essentially backward, something from the old. So I've started to figure this out a bit more. I realized that's capturing my mind. I had to dance like that guy who can't dance. I think he's called me Zeta. Yeah, he's a guy who's out of rhythm all the time. Yeah. Uh, but these were the heroes. But there were no heroes that looked like me. Nobody. When everything was advertised, I couldn't see nobody that looked like me. I was told that Marilyn Monroe was the epitome of beauty, that one day I should get married to someone like that. <laughs> you know? so, so then I uh, discussed the issue of fashion. Uh, those of you who have never thought that fashion is a white privilege thing going on there, uh, read the chapter. <laughs> read the chapter. Uh, and then finally, uh, also talk about the media, which we can talk about a lot. Uh, today, the global media is mainstream, the global media is dominated by, uh, by, by the white media. Others are struggling to find a place in it. And the last thing I talked about is the area, of course, I know, which is uh, the environment. And the, all the global ideas for saving the world and sustainability is essentially <coughs> the environment. Do you know anyone know of uh, 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 an environmental spokesman worldwide famous who's not white? The point I want to make about the environment is a serious one. It's most of the ideas about sustainability and this is stuff that I've been doing for 30 years is essentially rooted in the idea that the West need not change. It will capture the moral narrative and all the solutions will come from the Western system. And who are the gatekeepers of that entire Western system? The same people I talked about, firms, etc. So now we've got ESG, another Ponzi scheme of nothing. Right. Uh, anyone working for a couple of company here doing ESG nonsense? Big four, right? Um, no science, nothing. But yeah, I went through a course on ESG and now I'm an ESG auditor. But, but I work for e, uh, Ernst & Young, PwC. We don't work for, you know, Krishna Wong and Ali. But I want to form this company called Krishna Wong. <laughs> it sounds good, right? It sounds good. Uh, so that whole focus focus, and I've written about it in my second book, and so I want to say that all, even in the environment front, the idea of net carbon, net zero, which, you know, if you come from a technical science background like me, this is a myth. There is no such thing. But net zero then wasn't written in Iran, India, or China. It was written in the West. Because it's a very convenient way of trading, trading the gas. And if you give trading something you can't see, to the investment banks and the big four, my God, they will be, create the biggest Ponzi scheme in the world. It's called net zero. <laughs> right. So that's, a, that's all of these solutions are coming from people who don't want the world to change, see everything as a business opportunity, but ultimately <clears throat> cannot accept that they will have to essentially adapt to a new world in which the majority are non-Western. 85% of the world will have to essentially live different lives, and the Western world will have to confront that reality of living with that. 
So even the environmental solutions are dictated by just a few. As I said, none of you probably know of uh, non-Western global experts on sustainable Now, but there are many. But that's not how the narrative is. So in all of the spheres, that's what I try to get the book to do. The most important sort of uh, feedback I've had is from people from Asia who are in Africa who said to me, thank you for writing this. I always thought there was something going on. But now I have a simple narrative through which to explain. And I finished by saying that there's some who said this is an anti-white, anti-Western book. It's completely not that. It's essentially a book about equity. And we cannot have equity if we have a minority of people with such, in, uh, such influence serving themselves, writing all the global rules and creating all. I will start with globalization. Um, and in the book, you, you characterize it as a way in which, as in <coughs> former imperial and colonial powers were granting their former colonies independence, they, they assembled a market structure which was designed to make sure that their economic dominance was protected in a post-colonial um, order. But I think, I think now what we've seen, you know, you look at Brexit, you look at Trump, you look at the rise of populism, um, mm -hmm. you look at that in the West and, uh, and people are saying, hey, wait a minute here, globalization's decimated the Rust Belt, it's taken jobs away from the working class, the white working class, so do you think that this somehow symbolizes a moment in time that forces such as the rise of China makes it so that white people now think that their order of globalization has shifted to such an extent that it risks threatening their privilege? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, Donald Trump was elected for two reasons. One is the, the trauma of having a black person in the White House for eight years. They said, we got to take revenge. We're going to make sure no ends get in the White House again. So that was the trauma. But the other part of the trauma was Donald Trump said, we can be number one. And that's what you know um, Americans want to hear. Whether the Republicans or Democrats, that's what they want to be, number one. And I always said, I thought Donald Trump was very honest. At least he said, I'm a white supremacist and I want us to be number one. I can dig that, at least I know. But before that was all the facade that, you know, we believe in globalization and we want to be fair and all of that. We'll have a sort of half black guy in the White House and everything is cool because it serves a liberal narrative. But Donald Trump basically exposed the line. And I've always said uh, to Asians, I never understood, I'm not anti-American. But I'm very anti its, um, its destructive ca capacity and not being called out. Um, and I've always said that I could never understand why so many in Asia thought, uh, never questioned American power and the way it was used. I come from Southeast Asia. I know what happened in Vietnam. Right? No one said sorry ever. So, um, but what Donald Trump did was wake up a lot of sleeping people around the world what America really is. It's a white supremacist nation that will go to any lens to protect its power, and that power is economic power. So in the book, I talk about the fact that the best way to understand, uh, you know, white privilege is the best way to understand how Western nations and societies seek uh, a within and between nations to promote and retain power with the sole view of retaining economic hegemony. And that's what it is. So when I'm in Europe, they say, no, we're different from the Americans. I said, yeah, I know, but you're still willing to follow the Americans because the Americans at this stage still believe they can maintain that old world, world order of America, white power around the world, to control the institutions. And, they, and, the, and the Europeans are willing to hang on to their coattails to retain that because they don't want to lose that privilege. And thus the alliance. 
So I was in Europe a few months ago, and I said to the Europeans, and in fact, last week I was talking to 200 diplomats from a European nation, and I said, the best thing you can do is decouple from the United States, have a foreign policy that is independent. But we should be thinking about the, the reforming of the global system that liberates hundreds of millions of people in Africa, India, uh, Asia, from that tyranny of that system that says our rules are no rules. And actually, you know, one of the things that it's, I mean, it's been a bugbear of mine for um, as long as um, the West has been jumping up and down about the rise of China. And that's that, and that's that when you, when you hear the rhetoric, they're actually quite open and honest about it. You've got to give them that when they say, when they say, all we're asking for is that Beijing adheres to a rules-based order. Okay, so whose rules, right? Yeah. And that's, that's so simple, you know, whose rules? So others want other rules now. And a nation like China wants different rules. A nation like India has been calling for lots of different rules. I mean, I think India was the main sort of, uh, you know, um, obstacle to the GATT agreements and many of the Doha agreements because India didn't want to open its uh, cities to more Tesco's and uh, other stuff. You know, because that was what it was, open free markets and all of that. And before you know it, it's an HSBC everywhere. There's a Goldman Sachs everywhere and there's Tesco's everywhere. And India wanted to protect that. And they so people wanted different rules to play by. And that's what's happening in the world today, uh, a demand for different rules. But many of us are tuned to the fact there's only one set of rules and those rules were set by the, the post-colonial powers and it must be so good. Well, it's turning out to be very unfair, and others want multiple rules that serve their needs as well. You know, how do you see white privilege manifest itself here in Hong Kong today? And, and was 2019 a turning point um, for the city in terms of how it thinks about its place and its context and, and its history? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I came to Hong Kong uh, before the handover in uh, 1990. Uh, I don't think anyone needs to be told that it was essentially uh, a colony. And so white people had privilege. It's very simple. I was a member of the football club, and there were very few Chinese people. I left the football club after two years because I saw uh, people telling helpers that they couldn't come to the swimming pool. I said, this is, the I thought I left this in South Africa. You know, I thought I'd, I'd be fought for this stuff, stuff, and it was still happening. So I think we all know that that's uh, that's happening. But the club thing, I just before I get to the you know the universities and students, um, the the club thing is very interesting. Um, rich people in the riches like the Brits, they don't show well because they're so confident in what they have. You know, all the slaves are out of sight. Uh, they're working in the Cameroon, you know, picking cocoa. I own a chocolate factory, but nobody knows. You know, I own the tea plantations in Assam, but nobody knows. So they don't need to show wealth anymore, so they can be. But the insecure, the new wealthy, the people from all the colonies, they want to show wealth. So I often argue that you know, the decolonization process was the elites. This is my country too. The elites say, I want the... I want the, the colonial uh, rulers out, but my God, I want to be like them. Why? Because they were educated like that. They went to the schools. That's all they know. They know nothing else. Um, and so they want to be like them. And then next thing, they adopted the East India Company model, which is the economic model of our world, which is an extractive model. Right? So that economic model then became legitimized with all the new language. So you don't have to essentially employ slaves anymore uh, or underpaid labor and rubber tappers. Now you can control it through different things. Then you have supply chains, which is essentially a way of externalizing the cost to places you can't see. Right? So all the underpricing. So the rich always then, the, the, the non-white rich people in the developing world post-colonial era 
um, not knowing anything else, read Shakespeare, you know, you have to drop a bit, a few words on Macbeth at the po cocktail party to be seen, to be educated, etc. We all know that gig. Uh, you, you know, you read Burns and all of that. Otherwise, you must be a peasant. So you do all of that, you seek legitimacy because you're insecure. Because you wanted so much to be like this. You want to be like this. So that's a real problem we still suffer from. And I think I say this openly because, you know, and I say this delicately, but white people don't know this. But the Asians know this. They know what I'm saying. And some of them get angry with me like, oh man, how come you let the secret out? <laughs> you know? This is supposed to be all of us keep this together in the club. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's a problem. So then to the, the education bit. So the whole thing is, you know, get our kids to the Ivy League. And where do they come back to when they, when they finish? They go to the Ivy League, the Flat Earth Society, Harvard Business School, et cetera. And they come back to Hong Kong as stormtroopers, work for Goldman Sachs. Work. And I'm saying, you know, I'm just casting in entire, but they don't go and do anything else because where is the power? You spend all that money on your business education. You went to Ivy League. You spend 100000 the parents invested. When you come back, you ain't going to go and work for the Global Institute for tomorrow, as cool as we are. <laughs> like, you know, we got the best kind of job that you could ever have. But, you know, got to get my return. So who gives you that? The gatekeepers of the system. So the gatekeepers of the system are very happy to have all these minions, the brightest and best Asians, all can do maths, Send them off, and now the Indians are taking over all the banks. You all know this, right? Uh, send them off all that, and then they come back and work for the big Western banks, Citibank, etc. Perfect. Hey, my, by the way, we got some diversity too. Now we got some Indians, some Chinese, and we got some women, some Muslims. But who are they? Their minds are completely captured by that education system. I, I think there are certain things that have to take place through a, a top-down, right? International agreements. So international agreements that reframe uh, this whole issue of sanctions regimes, making it almost illegal for unilateral actions by the United States and its Western allies. That would be certain things. So you could do that. The UN can start to really mobilize that. Uh, I was last year in discussions with uh, the, there's certain things we can do. Um, I was in discussions trying to, you know, contribute to the G20 meetings in Indonesia because I, I knew a couple of one of the ministers, etc. And I was saying, for the first time, can the G20, because it's being hosted by Indonesia, the host, put on the table that the G20 will actually look at over a 20 year time frame, ensuring that there would no more be just the big four. And therefore, that in the global trade order and in terms of uh, the, the gatekeepers of the system, etc., you would now have to mandate that there would be 25 companies from around the world. And you would say there would have to be a geographical distribution. But then at the local level, and I have in my end last cha chapter, say, how do we have to do, of course you have to do locally things, you know. So if you're in a company here, and uh, firstly, uh, read the book, be willing to have a very difficult conversation with your peers. <clears throat> so many people are afraid. So I know people of Asian, from Asians, et cetera, who work for multinationals, they said, man, I can't even have this conversation in my office. It's so difficult. My DNI person, who's an Australian, you know, DNI Australian in Hong Kong, that's an interesting one, just saying, yeah, uh, don't even want to talk because they can't understand and it's a difficult conversation to have, right? So if you work for a company, take one of those topics, and I do give you, if you're in public policy, if you work for government, if you work in a multinational, you work in academia, just bring it out. So if you're in academia, well, let's talk about this curriculum. This, is this really what 21st century 
you know, uh, post-Western world equity discussions of look like? Is this what we should be teaching? Have the conversation. But if you're in a large company, what are we serving? What are you actually doing? You have to ask yourself. So that's at the most personal level. At the most personal level, am I furthering white privilege or am I actually furthering the, the creation of a more fair world?